Welcome to the channel. My name is Aaron. I've done a few videos now on the Apple One, and now it's time to add some accessories to the Apple One. I've got the Apple One up and working, but I need to add a keyboard and a monitor so that I can actually use it for the next steps, which will be adding a cassette player and hopefully building a case. But adding a keyboard and a monitor can come with their own perils because they're also old equipment that may need to be fixed up themselves in order to get them up and running again so that you can hook them up to the Apple One. Well, that's what I'm gonna cover today and it's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. So if you follow my channel, then you probably already know that I've been doing a series on the Apple One. I've actually been working on this project for months, collecting the parts, researching the history. In fact, I did a whole episode just on the history of the Apple One, and then I did another episode where I built the Apple One from scratch to a working state, or at least I think it's working. But in order to test it any further, I need a working keyboard so that I can enter some commands and find out if programs will run. I mentioned before that you could use an Apple II keyboard or an Apple II Plus keyboard on the Apple One, or you could use a Datanetics keyboard. I was lucky enough to find an Apple II Plus that had been sitting around either in someone's basement or somewhere, definitely had seen some water, so I bought it with the idea that I could salvage the keyboard and use it in the Apple One. I took it to my vintage computer meetup where I disassembled the Apple II Plus and removed the keyboard. This thing was really rusty. It's definitely seen some better days. And that's one reason why I don't mind taking this apart. Normally, I would want to restore a computer like this, but it's missing the cover I can see that the ICs are severely water damaged, and so I'm hoping that at least the keyboard will work because that would be a perfect donor keyboard for the Apple One. So once I got the keyboard out of the case, I needed to hook it up to an existing Apple II and see if it worked. Luckily, in my garage, I just happened to have a working Apple II. So I took the cover off and connected this keyboard to the working Apple II. And as expected, there are some problems. Now, some of the keys worked, but a lot of them had repeating key presses, and some of the keys didn't work it at all. So I decided to disassemble the entire keyboard and fix any broken key switches and make sure that everything was working before I moved on to hooking it up to the Apple One. So I moved the keyboard over to the bench, and taking a closer look, you can see this thing is absolutely filthy. I don't know what is in there, dust, bugs, I don't know what. So I got out the keycap puller and started pulling the keys one by one and dropping them into a bath of nice warm soapy water where they will sit for a little while while they get all that dirt and grime loosened up. Next, I took the keyboard out to the garage and tried to use some compressed air to get rid of some of this dust, but it seems like the longer these things sit around, the more cemented the dust gets to the materials on these vintage systems. So I broke out the industrial size carton of Q-tips, sprayed it down with Windex, and then rubbed in between all the keys until all the grit and the grime was gone. Next, I grabbed my toothbrush and scrubbed each key, all four sides, the top and the bottom, to make sure I got everything out of there. And it's a good thing I did because I noticed there was quite a bit of dirt under the key caps, which you don't normally see. Then I rinsed the keys in the sink and brought them back to lay them out on the towel to dry overnight. So the next morning, the keys were nice and dry and shiny and ready to go back on the keyboard after I finished the rest of the restoration. I also soaked some of the screws that were rusty in some vinegar, and that seemed to clean them up quite a bit. 
For the key switches themselves, I wanted to try just adding a few drops of deoxid to each key switch and then exercising it up and down, oh, you know, a few 20 or 30 or 40 times maybe, um, just to get the deoxid worked in. I thought that that would probably help lubricate whatever was under these key switches. And then I brought the keyboard back out before I put the keycaps back on and just gave this thing a test. And unfortunately, as you can see, it didn't really help anything that much. So the first thing I wanted to do was eliminate the possibility that the controller itself was causing the problem. I wanted to make sure that these switches were actually activating when I pressed down on them. So I got out my meter and put it into continuity mode. And when I pressed down on the actual key in question, there was nothing connecting that switch together. So that meant the problem was at the key switch itself and not in the controller. So I desoldered one of the key switches to see how it worked and try to find out why the deoxid didn't help. I found that if I pried gently on uh, the sides of the case, this little gray plastic part, I could actually pull the key switch out relatively easily and the plastic wasn't too brittle so it didn't break apart. Inside each key switch there's two metal leafs that are separated ever so slightly so that when you press down on one part of the switch it actually forces the two metal plates to make contact and that of course closes the switch. So I figured there must be some corrosion or oxidation in between these two plates and that's why the keys weren't working. It also explains why the deoxid didn't work at first because I was spraying down into a part that wasn't going in between these two plates. So what I decided to do was disassemble the keys that weren't working, hold those two plates open and really uh, squirt in some of that deoxid in between there and then work it with my finger back and forth until I could measure it with my multimeter that it was actually making good contact. The other thing that can happen to these keys is that the little metal piece that gets pushed down and in to the switch to, make, to force those two plates together can get bent over time. Imagine if you left something heavy on top of the keyboard and had those keys depressed for maybe years at a time, eventually the metal would become bent in a way that uh, wouldn't keep it as springy as it was originally. So the way I fixed this was I took a pair of needle nose pliers and just bent the metal uh, back out ever so slightly, maybe just by a few degrees. And this gives it a, just a little bit more springiness so that when you press the keys down, there's more force to press against those two plates and thereby you're more likely to make a good connection. To help me through this testing process, I made a picture of the Apple II Plus keyboard and then I marked each key that wasn't working quite right. So that way I could come back and I would know which key to work on and I could mark it off when it was complete. All in all, I had to disassemble and repair 16 of the key switches, but by going through this process, I was able to get them all working. It took a few days, but I think the effort was worth it. The keyboard now looks fantastic and I can't wait to attach this to the Apple One. So you cannot simply attach an Apple II keyboard directly to the Apple One because the pinouts aren't compatible, even though the socket is the same size. So what I did was I created this simple adapter on a PCB board so that I can remap the signals the way they're supposed to be from the Apple II keyboard to the Apple One motherboard. So I soldered some pin headers onto the board and then I cut a DIP16 ribbon cable in half and then after I put on some IDC headers, one end would go to the Apple One and the other end would go to the Apple II keyboard encoder. However, upon testing this, I quickly found that the pinout was not correct. It turns out that in my schematic, I had used a symbol that had the pin numbers going vertically down the side of the pin, just as they would in a dip socket. However, when I went to lay out the PCB, I chose the standard IDC header, which has the pin numbers altering uh, down the columns one after another. And of course, this isn't going to match up at all. So I had to redesign the board and then get it sent off for processing and rush delivery. When I need high quality prototype PCBs like this made in a hurry, I turn to PCBWay. You can get prototype PCBs as low as $5 and they do assembly, 3D printing, CNC milling, pretty much everything you need to build your projects. 
So check out PCB Way for low-cost PCBs and way more vintage computer fun. And I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. All right, well, we wait for the uh, uh, fixed boards to come in. That fixed my mistake here. Uh, we can still do some things to get ready so that hopefully when the new boards arrive, uh, there's less to do and that we can just hook it up and get going. So the other thing I want to do is, uh, remember, with the Apple One, you need a couple of keys available that typically you wouldn't find on a normal keyboard. Uh, one of them is one to clear the screen because you have to clear the screen when you reset the computer. And number two is the reset command to reset the computer. So clear screen, reset. And the uh, luckily, since we're using the Apple II Plus keyboard here, uh, or it could just be from an original Apple II, um, there's a couple of keys that it has. The reset function, which should work regularly, the reset will just uh, uh, send the reset signal. And you can actually switch that on this encoder. This is the encoder board from the back of the, the uh, keyboard. Um, but on this encoder, encoder module, it has a switch. And if you push it one way, in the control, uh, it says control under here, that means you have to hit control reset to reset the computer. And if you push it the other way, you only have to hit reset to hit the, to reset the computer. They don't give those kind of options nowadays with Apple products. You pretty much have to do it their way. Anyway, so I've got it set for reset. So that way I can just hit reset. It's more in the uh, Apple One style of doing things. I don't want to have to necessarily worry about hitting control reset. Now, the reason they did that though, I think, was because the return key is very close to the reset key. So it would be pretty easy if you got used to this keyboard layout, which I'm not. I keep hitting the over arrow instead of return. Uh, but if you got used to this, it would be pretty easy to, to mistakenly perhaps hit reset. And so I think that's why they went down this path and then that stuck with Apple ever since. But the clear screen is a button that you have to add. And some people add a special uh, external button to clear the screen, either on the side of the case or somewhere near the keyboard so that they can hit that clear screen because there's not a clear way to do that. In this case, I'm going to be using the repeat key because I don't plan on ever really using it. Uh, I did validate that it does work and it will repeat a character, but I, I just don't see using that. So instead of hooking up a special button, I'm going to be modifying the encoder board uh, to send the repeat. And so when I hit repeat, it'll actually send five volts to the clear screen and it will clear the screen. And so that's what this board does. It actually has a, a couple things on it. It has uh, uh, one of the non-used pins, pin four. It takes that non-used pins and we're going to connect that to the signal from this repeat switch. Um, and that will send the five volts. So we're using one of the normally non-used pins from the keyboard layout of the Apple II. And then that will go over to where it expects to uh, clear the screen on the Apple I side. So in order to make that happen from a physical standpoint, what we're gonna do is we're gonna disconnect where the repeat key comes into the encoder board. And then we're gonna have to do a little bit of modification on this encoder board. So we're gonna cut some traces and then solder on some wire to some places on the back of the board so that we can get access to the five volts. And so the output of this repeat key will go into uh, pin number four. There are lots of other things that you can do with this encoder board. I got this idea from a website uh, from uh, Wendell Sander, who published this back in 2010. He's since gone on to do like custom encoder boards and all kinds of things. Uh, pretty cool, so check that out. But I'm just going to go with one of his original ideas, which was this mod here. So you're going to need something sharp. Um, I know this is this kind of... Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't feel this way about technology, but it's like, oh, I don't want to cut anything on the board. But in this case, we have to cut two traces. We have to cut one on this side of the board, um, which is right here next to pin 19, and then pin 20 as well. And that's the trace for that is going on the back side of the board here. So just go ahead and uh, when you're sure you've got the right trace, I'm gonna cut it here kind of close to the pin because I could always put this back if I wanted to, I could just do a solder bridge right there and, and go back, uh, revert this back to stock if I wanted to fairly easily. But you're gonna need a sharp tool. In fact, I'm gonna sharpen this up a little bit more by cutting off, this is one of those blades where you can just snap off to get a fresh edge and I'm gonna do that. There we go. Now I've got a nice sharp edge. Just make a straight cut. Oh, 
That's why you gotta be careful. Luckily there was no other traces there. So that's pin 19. Let's go over to pin 20 where I'm gonna be even extra careful here. Let's cut that trace. I am so lucky that there's not another trace on the side of the board because I'm not doing a very good job of this. That should do it, but just to be sure, let's check. So you can figure out where this pin 20 goes on the board, or you can look at the schematics and see where that goes. And then you can use your multimeter to test and see if it actually is disconnected. Yep. So this one normally would be connected here and it is not connected. So we successfully cut that trace. So pin 19 should be going to that pin right there and it is definitely not uh, connected anymore. So cut the traces, should be good to go to make the rest of our mods. Okay, and there we go. I just hooked up some uh, small wires here. Not the cleanest soldering job I've ever done, but uh, there's pins 19 and 20. One side's going to five volts. I marked that one with a red cable so I would know which one it is. And then the other one goes to pin four. So when you press that button, uh, it'll go through this board over to the clear screen pin, this board. This, when I get my new board in, it'll go over to the clear screen pin and it will clear the screen. So now we should be able to, we should be good to go as soon as I get my new fixed PCB from PCB Way. One week later. All right, now that these boards have arrived, it's time to fix my mess with this old board. So we can take a look at what these look like. And there we go, I got some extras. If these work, <laughs> uh, I got some extras to give to people or to, uh, you know, if they want to do the same thing I'm doing here, they could do it. So let's hope this one works this time. I'm just going to go ahead and solder up the connections and then I'll test the pinout. I've got the uh, this side of my multimeter connected to pin 16, which 16 and 15 are uh, 5 volts in this case. And uh, that should be connected to pin 1 over here on the encoder board. So if this little mapping PCB that I have here is working correctly, I should get uh, continuity over here on this pin 1. And I do. Woohoo! Awesome. Okay, one down. <laughs> I got to check the rest of them. I do want to focus in on the power rails first because those are the things that would cause some serious damage if they were plugged in incorrectly. I certainly don't want to cause any issues on the Apple One. So let's go ahead and test the negative 12 volts, uh, which is on pin 11. Hey, all right. Looking good. Uh, last one I want to check is ground. So on the Apple one, that is pin nine. So it should be down here. Yep. That's ground. All right. So everything is looking good. I'm going to go ahead and test all the rest of the connections just to make sure that everything is working. But at this point, as long as I don't have any issues, I feel pretty comfortable hooking up this keyboard to the Apple one. And I don't remember if I explained it before or not, but this clear screen in the middle here, um, I think I showed you how I was going to use the, the repeat key here uh, to trigger that. But if you didn't have one of these keyboards, you could just hook up uh, uh, both sides of a switch. You know, just a regular, let's see, like a push button kind of switch or something. Here we go. So you could just wire in a couple of connections to this switch and put the switch wherever you want. And then you could press press that. And that would... Uh, that would trigger the clear screen if you wanted to do it that way. So I've got that as an option as well. Okay, so now it's time to take a look at the display I'm going to be using for the final Apple One build. And I was just looking at this box that's been sitting out in the garage, but uh, this was shipped in February, and it's now August. So that just shows you how long I've been planning this particular build. Um, it's just been sitting out there waiting for me to come open it. I haven't opened it yet, so... Go ahead and open it and see what's inside. Well, and here it is, the Sanyo VM4512. So very similar to the monitors that would have been used or recommended to use with the Apple one back in the day. Even though there was a Sony uh, black and white television that Steve Jobs recommended to a dealer somewhere, I think I mentioned this in the history video, 
this monitor probably would have been used, uh, uh, would have been preferred over that because it has things like horizontal hold, vertical hold, brightness, contrast, and uh, not only that, but if we look at the back, it takes a composite input. So all the controls that you would be, you would need are right here. This would be, it even says for commercial use only, uh, but this would have been a great little monitor to pair with the Apple one because you could go, you wouldn't need a RF modulator. You could just go right into the back of this and get your display out. So this is what I'm going to be testing. I do need to go grab uh, one of these larger UHF style BNC type connectors. It's larger than your typical BNC. I believe it's called a UHF connector. And uh, I'll go grab one of those and we'll plug it in and see if it works. So before I do that, let's just do a quick smoke test actually, before I go to all the effort of digging out uh, uh, everything, getting everything set up and all that. Let's just do a quick smoke test. Let's turn it on and see if if there, we even get high voltage on the screen. Here we go. Nope. Yeah. There's nothing there. So I guess uh good thing I didn't pull everything out. Let's go ahead and tear this open and see if I can find a simple problem that's happening with this monitor. And for those of you who uh, want a closer look at the, uh, the back of the uh, unit, that's what it looks like. It's got a video in and a video out. It has a built-in DC jack. Um, it's got DC restoration and high impedance, high impedance or 75 ohms. And then it's got a, uh, looks like a horizontal height and a vertical uh, height or vertical lin there um, as well. So that's what it looks like from the back. And even though I didn't see anything at first, actually I tried this one more time and looks, look what happens when I turn it on. If I just would have waited a little bit, I could have seen the raster coming on. So although I, there's not a lot of, there's in fact, there's no, I don't hear any degauss and there's no uh, static on the screen. I am getting at least somewhat of a picture. So I'm going to see if I can hook something up to this now and see if it'll work. Okay, well, sorry for the flashing. Let's go ahead and turn this on and see what happens. Hey, there's something. Let's see if I can dial this in a little bit. Well, we're getting better. I don't know if you can see I adjusted the brightness and the contrast. The pots definitely need to be cleaned, but I can definitely see at symbols here. And actually, the picture is a little bit askew, so probably the uh, um, adjustments on the tube are just a little bit off, or maybe there's a magnet that's off or something. But it's it's actually looking pretty good other than that. It's very sharp. So I'm going to try to reset it and see what we get here. Okay, there's the reset. Now I need to do, or there's the clear screen. Now I need to do a reset. There we go. So not bad. I think there's still a few adjustments that need to be made, but it's looking pretty good. Um, you know, I can see the screen. It's very, very bright, but you can see what happens with this pot if I turn it just a little bit. It gets it's pretty wonky. So it's not making good contact there. Oh, that's looking better. There, look at that. Okay, so yeah, really just need to uh, get some deoxid out, take this apart, get some deoxid out and clean these pots. But now that's looking really good and really sharp. Incredibly sharp, actually. So good, success. It looks like this thing's going to work. Okay, so I brought the keyboard out to test on the actual Apple One. This is a little scary because if I did get anything wrong here, uh, I could fry some circuits that are difficult to replace or fry some some uh, uh, integrated circuits that are difficult to replace. So yeah, this is why you test, 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 and why I tested out every single connection on that board and why I replaced this PCB. Um, also notice this is kind of dangling in the air here. I don't want this to touch anything because there is five volts and uh what was it 12 negative 12 volts uh going through this board the back of this board so i'm being careful not to let this touch anything metallic same with the uh, uh, keyboard here i'm not resting it on top of the apple one of course i'm resting it off to the side anyway let's go ahead and turn it on and see if the keyboard works fingers crossed please work please don't blow anything up Okay, 
Nothing blew up. That's good. <laughs> the, uh, the power light is on. That's awesome. That means we're getting five volts probably through the board. So that means things are hooked up correctly. And, uh, we have the, the blinking, they should be blinking at signs, but they're not quite. So anyway, let's first test out the uh, clear key. We need to do a, a clear screen and that should be this repeat key. Hey, that works. Awesome. <laughs> and now we can hit the reset key. There we go. We're back to the cursor. So this time with an actual keyboard that's gonna work without hooking up any extra buttons, which is great. Let's just go ahead and test some of these uh, numbers. Yeah, <laughs> looking good. Oh, there's a few repeats still, but that's okay. You can always go back and fix that. Uh, what the? That's weird. You notice this uh, pattern on the screen, although I don't notice it down here and I didn't notice it before. Let's just see. Yeah, that's interesting. As I continue to add characters, it skews more and more as I add more characters across the screen. So that can't be right. I don't know if that's the monitor or the Apple One. Let me dig into that, uh, but I'm just glad the keyboard is seems to be working. Awesome. So at this point, I hooked the Apple One back up to the Apple IIc monitor, and that seemed to work fine. So then I hooked up an Apple II to the old style monitor, and that also seemed to work fine. It just happened to be the night of the vintage computer meetup at the Makerspace, so I brought the Apple One there and hooked it up to a normal widescreen TV. That also worked. In fact, uh, I was able to let some of the people that showed up at the meeting actually type in the very first program on the Apple One, which was pretty cool. So what the heck was going on here? Well, I just happened to stumble across a post by good old Uncle Bernie about some wonky video issues. I guess the signal uh, that's coming out of the Apple One is not necessarily fully standard with the normal NTSC signal that you would expect to see. So he came up with a way to mod the video signal to get it back more into spec with the standard, and hopefully that will correct some of these issues I'm seeing on the Apple One. The mod itself consists of a capacitor, a transistor, and a few resistors. So it's pretty simple to add to the bottom of the Apple One. So after soldering in all the components and securing the wire with a little capped on tape, I was ready for my first test. Clear the screen. Reset. Okay, there we go. So that's looking okay, but let's see what happens when we start typing in characters. A little wavy. Okay, it's a little wavy, but it is better. So at this point, I needed a little help to troubleshoot this further. Now, because I had bought Uncle Bernie's kit for the Apple One on eBay, he gave me not only his tips and tricks document, but I was also able to contact him if I had questions that perhaps he could answer. So I asked him about this issue. He recommended putting in a few trimmer pots in place of a few of the resistors to see if changing those values would help out in any way. And as a matter of fact, it did. I ended up removing a couple of these resistors completely, uh, and that seems to have solved the problem. Now, of course, every monitor is different. Just because this worked for me doesn't mean it will work for you. But I do recommend adding in Uncle Bernie's video mod to see if that will help if you do start seeing some of these wonky video patterns on the screen. And since I had the soldering iron out, I decided to go ahead and replace these two Sprog uh, capacitors that were too big, these two big blue ones. And I also put in a period heatsink to replace the uh, thinner, more modern heatsink that I had in there. That just helps make the Apple One just look a little bit more authentic. Now that I had that mystery solved, it was time to open up the monitor, take a look inside, and especially try to clean up those scratchy potentiometers on the front. Uh, being a more commercial monitor, I will say it comes apart pretty easily. 
The square boxy design means you can just lift panels off out of the way and get to where you need to fix things. This would have been perfect for someone doing service on these monitors. And just look inside. There's really not a lot of uh, components on the inside at all. Uh, other than that big beefy transformer, really all we have is the uh, connections to the yoke on the CRT. Got a little circuit board here with the flyback transformer. And then inside there, you can see those potentiometers that we're gonna have to get in and clean. Unfortunately, the only place I could find to spray some deoxid was right here, this little hole on the top of the potentiometers. So it's time for the deoxid, the clean maker. Mentos, the fresh maker. Uh, that's awful. Now, seriously, with a bit more disassembly, and uh, being very careful because, you know, there could be potential high voltage here. I was able to spray inside those pots with the deoxid and then move them around uh, lots of times just to work that in there. I think that'll do the trick on these pots just fine. And sure enough, the controls on the front are now working as good as they ever did. So I can finally get to playing with some programs, typing some things in, and more importantly, working on the case and finding an appropriate cassette player. All right, well, hopefully, as you can see at the end of my uh, trials and tribulations with getting the keyboard working and the monitor working, I just took a little break and enjoyed being able to use the Apple One finally uh, because I had the keyboard and the monitor working. So that was a lot of fun. I spent about a day just enjoying sitting back and enjoying typing in some programs, uh, even taking a first few steps at perhaps trying to load some programs off of my phone onto the Apple One. But we're gonna cover that next time. I'm gonna be going over how to load programs over the cassette interface or perhaps your phone, as well as building a replica wooden case uh, for the Apple One. And I'll talk more about that on the next episode. So I hope you enjoyed the episode today. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe. If you're a patron, be sure to stick around at the end of this video where I will have some commentary about this episode, some behind the scenes information. And of course, if you wanna become a patron and support me, you can do that as well. If you wanna find the address of where to send me things, I know a few of you have asked. You can actually find that in the about page, either on YouTube or on the website, uh, retrohackshack.com. All right, well, thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time. If you wanna support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash retrohackshack and sign up. End of line.